that you give us clarity of thought, soundness of mind, and purity in heart. Let there be clarity in the answers that we give also scripturally. Father, let us not lean to our own understanding, but in all our ways at this round table, mm -hmm. let us acknowledge you because it's our heart's desire that those who hear this, those who see this, will be touched, that they will be energized, that they will seek you even the more. So Father, we just thank you for everything that you're doing. It may seem like things are out of control, but Father, we know that you are in control. It may seem like there's some things that's impossible, Mm -hmm. But we know that with you, all things are possible. All things are possible. Thank you, God. So, Father, we just lift up your name and we welcome you in this place yes. right now. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Father, I just pray, Thank Father, you, that you just continue to bless these men. Thank you. Bless our efforts because it's about you. Mm -hmm. We're lifting up the name of Jesus. So that means that we are being obedient to the word of God. Thank you. And that's a blessing within itself. So, Father, I ask that you touch each man that's represented here tonight, whatever needs they may have, whatever decisions they may need to make. I pray, Father, that you enter into it right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Jack. Amen. Amen. Roger that. Um, <coughs> well, uh, good evening if you're watching this by video. Uh, my name is Daryl Harris. Um, part of Real Men Ministries Incorporated. To my right is Pastor Todd Woolston, Real Life Church in Virginia Beach. Woo, woo. Mm -hmm. okay. To his right is Nelson Marrero, Latino, A to J. Very creative type, and uh, he's one of the board members of Real Men. To his right is Richard Pickett. Richard Pickett is a minister, an elder, a longtime man of faith, and uh, part of the board for Real Men. Amen. Uh, to my second left over there, sipping that big old tall tea with the pink stripes on his socks <laughs> and the afro <laughs> is my man, Tom <laughs> Menefee. <laughs> all good. Tom all good. <laughs> all good. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'm excited about getting to know Tom. I've met Tom less than a year ago, and he's a man who loves God, a man who is uh, willing to draw other men to God, and uh, and very essential to this, this team and what we're doing. And then we've got the worshiper. Nobody can do anything in the kingdom of God without the worshiper. Amen. And that's Brother Jeff Wick. Amen. And uh, so we're happy to have Jeff here. We're going to talk a couple, about a couple of questions tonight. You see it up on the board there. Uh, and it is simply, why are there so many churches is the first question. Why are there so many churches? I'm going to kind of facilitate this discussion. But let's just take that question right now. Yeah. Why are there so many churches? And, and does that really necessitate a definition of what the church is? Well, I think I think there's some really good valid reasons why there's so many churches or more than a few churches. And I think there's some, unfortunately, some characteristics that the church, you know, has kind of become known for that have caused division. So there are some great reasons. I think some of those could be a missions-minded church who is planting other churches in other regions and areas that don't have churches and. Uh, and they have a specific call or a specific mission in that area. So obviously when that happens, churches are going to multiply. But there's some other issues as well that are on the negative side, which I think a lot of people uh, kind of gravitate to. And we, we get this question, why does there have to be so many churches, so many denominations, so many? And I, I think that at the, at the core of that, the, the, the word that we could use, I guess, is disunity or a lack of one accord. I'm grateful that this group doesn't at all look like that or sound like that or Amen. feel like that. Amen. Um, but that's a very real thing, man. And, uh, you know, the, uh, kind of the definition, the biblical definition I think about when I think about of one accord and everyone being on one accord doesn't mean that one accord means that everybody's way is the only way or the right way, but that we kind of uh, settle back for the benefit of the whole, the body of Christ, and that we come together, whether we agree on the color of the carpet or what you wear or not, but for the benefit of the whole, we see the greater good, and we come together. That's missing in a lot of places. I, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, when I think about the church, I, I have to go back to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16. Uh, when, when asked, who do men say that I am? 
the answer was given that he's the Christ, the Son of the living God. He told Simon, he told Peter at that time, uh, that Simon at that time, that flesh and blood didn't reveal that to him, but the Father in heaven revealed that to him. He said, and upon this rock, you, your name shall no longer be Simon, but it shall be Cephas Peter, a rock. And upon this rock, Jesus says, I will build my church, implying that there's only one church. So why so many churches? Well, you're talking about churches, the Boy, building. Come on now. So, <laughs> so versus that's churches, why I, the body of Christ. That's why I yeah. said, see, and, yeah. and Paul talks about the church as the body of Christ. Yeah. And Jesus being the head of the body. Yeah. Christ the head of, of, of uh, God the head of Christ, uh, the Father. Uh, the head of Christ and Christ the head of the church which is the body and we the church the worldwide body are different parts of the body of Christ one church if he says one Lord one faith one baptism one Holy Spirit into one church so why so many churches I think in, in, in a perfect sense of how Jesus intended it, there would only be, there is only one church. There is only one. Now the expression of that church is where we get the different denominations from. And that's not a problem because the Jews, when the church started, they were all with the Gentiles one church, but they had different practices. Like the Jews didn't want to eat any swine. The Gentiles didn't have a problem with that. They were both in the church though. See, I think if you if you walk by a building and you hear music playing and it stops you and you say, that is just great music, I like the way the horn sounds, or I like the way something in that music is so, I gotta find out wh what motivated that person. So that person walks in, another person walks by, they hear the music but they also see the stained glass windows. They see the windows and say, that is beautiful art. I gotta find out who constructed that. You see, they're not paying attention to the music, something else has grabbed them. They walk in. And that's our purpose is to get them into the body of Christ. And like Paul said, the foundation can no other man lay. There's only one foundation, right, and that's right, Christ. Right. Now, on top of that foundation, you're going to build. Now, you're either going to build something that can sustain fire or something that gets purified in fire. If, if you uh, build wheat, hay, and stubble, fire hits that, it's going it's to burn up. evaporate. Yeah. But... Uh, Gold, silver, precious stones, that gets purified in fire. So it's not so much, because uh, I got no problem with people who uh, do the hymns. I got no people who, no problem with people that stand up and, and, and shout and yell for the Spirit. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with the way they express their belief. My, uh, I guess, concern would be the foundation of their belief. I can worship with anybody as long as the foundation is Christ. He died for our sins and He rose again for our justification. I can just about talk to anybody as long as that's the foundation. I may not agree with anything else they build on that foundation, but that's just a preference for me. Okay, so, so you just made a distinction between essentials that every body of believers should believe and non-essentials that we can not embrace and and not deny. They may look different. Okay, so I, I will agree. There are essentials. What are those essentials? But we still haven't defined what the church is or who the church is. And the other word that came up was denomination. What is a denomination? Why so many churches? Are there so many churches because there are many denominations? And if so, then why so many denominations? Jesus tells us to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mm -hmm. And he says starting with where you're at and then it'll spread out into the whole world. So the scripture also tells us to forsake not the assembling of ourselves. So as we go out to preach the gospel, we communicate Christ. And we begin to get people who will hear that message and want to become a part of that message. That's a church really established right there with a body of believers. So when we're going out into the world, that means that churches is going to be everywhere where believers congregate at. 
because now we're assembling ourselves as believers and we are communicating Christ, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he says, if I be lifted up, mm -hmm. he said, I would draw all men unto me. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have so many churches, because like Pastor Todd said, some of them are really about the Father's business. Jesus is really being lifted up in some of these assemblies that we have where people have come together. And then you have others that have their own rendition of who Christ is. And these are false teachers that's establishing their own doctrines about Christ instead of sticking to the word of God. But when I see that red print and it tells me to go into all the world and preach the gospel, I have now become an ambassador of Christ. And if I get a group that want to congregate around that message, then I can start a church right there because the church is the body of Christ. Okay. You said you said uh, uh, you built you picked up on denominations. Mm -hmm. You said doctrines, right? Which are teachings, right? Okay, various teachings. Right. So then, are we divided on teachings? Is that the reason why we have so many denominations? And if we're divided on teachings, the question becomes why? Because Jesus was pretty clear. You said gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the good news, the good news of what? Of God invading humanity, cloaking himself in humanity, becoming a man, living amongst us, a sin-free life, right. to pay the penalty as he dies innocently, a lamb without spot or blemish, slain from the foundation of the world, mm -hmm. and dying upon this cross to pay the penalty for all man's sin. So it's pretty clear what the gospel is or what the essentials are. Right. So then, why so many denominations, why so many doctrines, why so many churches? Is there really but one church? We are just not united as one church. Is that the case? Because Peter says in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, he, he calls us living stones. We are. Christ being the chief cornerstone. And we're living stones. And so the individuals comprise the church. We come to a location to celebrate corporately and to worship corporately together because we're not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves. That's Hebrews chapter 10. Right. As some people are going to do that, but we are called together to spur one another on towards love and towards good works, having one mission, one gospel, but one Lord. His name is Jesus. He has one goal, and that's to save as many people through us as possible, because he wants no one in hell. So why so many churches? Is it because we as a people are confused about what we believe? I mean, we've heard it several ways. We've heard teaching and denominations. I think a lot of that comes back to individual interpretation of what you're reading and what you believe, what you want to believe versus what you really don't want to, you know, you want to leave that part out and just live this part. And, and that's, that causes, you know, sometimes a split within. We're saying churches, obviously we mean fellowships or buildings or groups of people, not the church, um, which is the body of Christ. But I think it all comes into play. We, you know, we've got humans who are imperfect, and I think I've met a lot of people <coughs> that have a great heart, I think a pure heart, and I think they really believe what they think they believe is right, and some of them aren't, you know, and, I, and I'm not always right. I've learned you know, in the recent years, some things that I would do very differently than I did starting out. You know, um, you know, so it's a process. But I, but I do know the individual piece, the interpretation of what you believe and what you read, who influences you, how that's influenced, and then our relational piece uh, all plays a part of it. So then, what I'm hearing is that the individuals um, are the church. But the individuals are grouped in organizations who have doctrines and teachings and, or, and for the purpose of being organized. And it's the organizations that form denominations or different groups uh, so that 
the individuals are not united around the same thing because the organizations are not united around the same thing. But those organizations are the parts of the body that is that belongs to Jesus on a worldwide scale. Um, so we have organizations, fellowships that that may be a finger, <coughs> big organizations, a finger in the body of Christ. Who have a certain function? Who hopefully believe? Hopefully, it's not the middle finger. And hopefully, it's not the middle finger. You know, I can throw that one out. <laughs> Trying to keep that thing down, but but a finger. Mm. And and so, how do we help people who don't believe in Jesus understand that that's really what's going on? Jeff, you were going to say something. Uh, it, it was basically the same thing, only different. You know. Um, uh, maybe different terminology. I don't know that there are different doctrines so much as just different traditions that have come about over the centuries um, since Christ. You know, um, you know, just celebrations of, of Christmas and Easter, for instance. There are some people that are adamant that, you know, and, and up until a few years ago, to my embarrassment, I, I had no idea that this was even a controversy, that Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. Right, right. right. Nobody, nobody ever said that to me. Right. But you never see it in the Bible. But no one's ever said that to me, so I just grew up this whole time. I just accepted it. <laughs> um, and, and so, but there are people that not only are, are they, um, you know, they're, they're disappointed in that fact, but, you know, that that, that was... Uh, a tradition. Uh, just a tradition the whole time, <clears throat> but they're they're dead set against it. You know that's that's you know it's a sin to celebrate that because Jesus didn't command that. You know, so I don't think they're different doctrines as as much as different uh, uh, traditions that that people believe. You know, because they they all read pretty much the same Bible. I mean, excluding maybe Catholicism or or, or Mormonism, right. you know, they we all we all go by the Bible. Yeah, I, I would I would certainly not put Mormons in the category of Christians, of uh, believers, because of how they because they believe that Jesus mm -hmm. was a created being, right? Which makes him a spirit brother of Lucifer, and that cannot be because but he's always been. He's that, that was my my and point is that yeah. there's you know very few uh, religions are are going at different doctrines. It's more so traditions and, and celebrations that are either celebrated or not. Yeah. You know, some of some of it being uh, communion or baptism. You know, those are those are controversies, but they're all reading the same Bibles we are. It, 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 that's true, but there's different interpretation of those two ordinances of the church. Right, and they're they're really foundational ordinances: mm -hmm. baptism and the Holy Communion. When do you take it? Is the is it prescribed or is it de merely so described? We grew up. It was the the third Sunday of every month. Right, or whatever. That's right. But that's not what the word says. You that's know, the word true. Says as often as you do this, remember me. It, right. Mm -hmm. And and so you know that becomes a tradition. The yeah. third Sunday of every month. That's yeah. just how we do it. Within water and baptism. Was, yeah. And it was brought about, uh, you know, just over over the centuries. But the problem with that tradition is it becomes a doctrine. Yes. And it, it becomes a staple in that community of belief. Right. And we do this because this is how we do it. And then we find something in the scripture to validate why we to do make what it we do. Fit. Right. And you do something uh, long enough, it becomes the new norm. And you yeah. have to Every, legitimize that. You know, that's kind of the way we do it. Everything starts with learning. And as a baby, you, you crawl, you fall. Then you walk, and you fall. The... The church, because I said earlier, I just want to clarify one thing, is we, something may attract us to Christ, attract something inside of me likes that. But the minute I become infused with Christ and I believe that he died for me, my desires have to change in time. Because the whole process is me getting to be more like him and less about who I was before I met him. If I'm still the same way three years later, mm -hmm. I'm not growing, so anything can... Can, can maneuver me in different directions. Because the one thing about truth, it stands alone. And it, it, it pushes off everything else. Truth, the minute you add something to it, you diminish it. Right. Because truth by itself is exclusive. So the minute I learn that, 
me, I have to change. And if I'm not changing, then I'm not learning. Because in every relationship, even a relationship I have with you, mm -hmm. when I first met you, we're not the same that we are now. Because right. if we were, I wouldn't know you like I know you now. Right. We had to learn about each other, and that was a give and take. Mm -hmm. You know, let's say where I grew up, the way to say hello to someone you like was to walk up to them and slap them. <laughs> You'd probably let me do that one time before you say, the next time, you don't want to do that. Right. Because that's not the way I show that I like someone. Yeah, yeah. See, now me, I would say, well, in order to respect him and get to know more about him, I know that I have to change that. Mm -hmm. The next time I see I can't do that because although that's the way I express it, that's not the way he feels when I do that. So I have right. to change. So primarily, the reason there's so many denominations in my, the, the way I see it, is that people refuse to be wrong. They refuse to even uh, to even explore the, the, the fact that they may be wrong. Right. And because you can't explore that, then you shut people out. That's why I say the foundation. I can be wrong about everything else I believe, but I'm not wrong about the foundation. Right. You can't argue with me about the foundation because the minute you do, then I know there's no, there's no way we can commune because we're not reading that book. Because the foundation <coughs> is in that book. That doesn't... Everything else may be tit for tat, but the foundation, there's no getting around that in that book. You have to literally tear stuff out of that book in order to kill the foundation. And I don't mean one piece. I mean out of every one of those 66 books, you have to tear something out of mm -hmm. in order to kill the foundation. Or you add something too, which is, yeah, right. which is what the <clears throat> universal church does. The yeah. Catholic church does. I want the listeners to, to, to hear this because Jesus says he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus did not die for brick and mortar. That's right. He died for you and I. That's right. So he's coming back for you and I. Mm -hmm. So when you say church, sometimes I think people think the bricks and mortar. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we are the church. Mm -hmm. We are the epistles. We're the living stones. We are red of men. That's what it tells us we are. So you're like a document. You're like a document. You're like a document. And the Holy Spirit will go through that document and he will begin to edit things out of your life that doesn't line up with this. Amen. And then he'll place from this into your life. Mm -hmm. And that's the change. That's the experience. But don't think like church meaning like building. Christ is not coming back for a building. He's coming back for those that have accepted him as Lord and Savior of their life. Amen. Amen. I'll agree with you. Tom, you have anything you want to add? No, because I don't know. Okay. Now, so let me let me just let me just summarize uh, what we said. We said that the church is not a building. It is the, the gathering of people who believe in Jesus. Jesus is the foundation, the head of the body of Christ, and he is the foundation. Those foundational principles are the gospel, they comprise the gospel, that he was born of a virgin, just like the Bible says, that he lived a sinless life, just like the Bible says, that he died upon that rugged tree, just like the Bible says, that he was resurrected on the third day, just like the Bible says, that he walked on the earth for 40 days, just like the Bible says, that he was ascended, he ascended up into heaven, just like the Bible says, and he is right now seated at the right hand of the Father, like the Word, like the Bible says. And one day he's coming back. While he's there, he sent the Holy Spirit to empower us to be better witnesses for him and what he has done and the work that he's done. And he's praying for us, making intercession for us. Right. There was nothing more important to him. As, or so are those the foundational principles. And one day he's coming back. Right. Now whether or not it's pre-trip or post-trip, we're not going to talk about that. But one day he's coming back. Those are the foundational principles. We can all agree on that. There's, an, uh, there's a, uh, a tangent, though, that some people add, and they add that there's a co-mediator. But the Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's the right. man Christ Jesus. That's there right. is not a co-mediator. So as long as we have our hope in him and his finished work, we are a member of the church and when we become a member of the church it is incumbent upon us we have the responsibility personally to get to know him and allow that this letter that God is writing to be edited by the Holy Spirit 
so that our lives can be read by others. Is that what we're saying? So we are the church, right? Absolutely. And Jesus expects us to be united. He expects us to love and he expects us to, to go off and tell others. Why so many churches then? Because individuals have not embraced who they are and what part they play in the body of Christ. And one last thing. Any church you find, make sure that the foundation is right because your very soul depends on that. Everything else is really preference. You have no preference as far as what exactly paid for your sins. It was his death on that cross that paid for your sins. And we know that God accepted that as payment because he brought him out of the grave. You have to believe that. Because if not, you will believe a lie. And when you get to the other side, there'll be no hope. There's no place where you get counseling once you die. Once you die, it's over. Amen.